Welcome to The Politocrat. I'm Omar Moore. It is Wednesday, November the 18th, 2020. On this edition of The Politocrat, a conversation with Judith Brown Dianus, the racial justice attorney, civil rights advocate and educator, and executive director of the Advancement Project. We will talk about voting rights, about black people and disenfranchisement and the fight against disenfranchisement, plus what happened in Wayne County in Michigan last night. That conversation coming up next. With me right now is a racial justice attorney, and she's done so much great work. Um, Judith Brown Dianus is someone who is the executive director of the Advancement Project. She has worked with dealing with restoring the voting rights to felons who have been disenfranchised. She has done a lot of work on voting rights, especially with the strict voter ID laws that have been passed as a result of the evisceration of Section 4 by the U.S. Supreme Court in 2013. Uh, The Advancement Project is an organization at advancementproject.org that handles a number of different issues, education, addresses issues around the school-to-prison pipeline, and so many other things that a great organization does, like the Advancement Project, and a great leader of that organization, Judith Brown Dianus, welcome to the Politocrat podcast today. Thank you for having me. Uh, I just wanted to uh, first of all talk about where we where we stand now with voting, and obviously, um, a lot of people understand that there has been an ongoing attack on voting in this country. We've seen it from the ninety early nineteen hundreds. Uh, to 1965 and, and Amelia Boynton and John Lewis and all of these things that have happened, civil rights workers being killed. And then we get to 2013 with the Shelby versus Holder decision uh, and the U.S. Supreme Court that got rid of Section 4 preclearance. And now we get to today and what's happened since, because we had a lot of black voters turn out, brown voters turn out. There was still lots of voter suppression. But we get to Wayne County. I wanted you to talk a little bit about where we are with voting, particularly what happened in Wayne County yesterday. Um, Your first, your reaction to that, and then perhaps we can have a little bit broader discussion. Sure. Um, So Wayne County, uh, where Detroit is, um, (laughs) As the um, the way the process works is that we vote and then the vote gets certified by a, a local canvassing board, um, and that vote is then certified and then it goes to the state and usually then the state seats their electors who actually elects the president. So what happened was that the electors deadlocked. Um, I think it was two to two, uh, two Republicans uh, against two Democrats, and they didn't want, that meant that they couldn't certify the vote. Um, And the Republicans, I guess at the time, were saying, well, there are some irregularities, and so we can't approve certification of the vote in Wayne County. Detroit, (laughs) where Black folks turned out in record numbers and voted overwhelmingly for Biden. And so um, it left this moment where, you know, there was this question about if the vote in Detroit is not certified, then what happens to the vote in the state of Michigan? And so, um, so that was freaking people out for... A little while. <laughs> so, um, apparently, a lot of organizing happened, a lot of folks on the ground um, showing up and showing out and saying, no, you got to certify this vote. And it's funny, I was actually watching CNN last night, and the Secretary of State, Jocelyn Benson, was on CNN 
talking about this. And this was all playing out in real time yesterday. And literally while she was on CNN, they had changed the vote and certified the vote. Um, so the canvassers changed their vote. So, um, so, you know, this, I mean, I think what this boils down to is that there are, um, a large swath of Republicans who do not want to recognize that Joe Biden and Kamala Harris won. And they don't want to certify the vote. And they just are being recalcitrant. And they are, um, I would, some of them are buying into the Trump BS about voter fraud and irregularities. Um, and some of them are not, but they're just saying they are, right? Because this is a way to stop the certification. And I think that the, the thing that keeps coming up is like these maneuvers to try and manipulate our democracy, um, in order to maintain power. And that's what this is about is maintaining power. Um, and so this was a last stitch effort, I guess, to, try and upset the apple cart in Detroit of all places. And and we need to understand that the reason this would come up in Detroit is because there's this this continuing narrative around black and brown voters, particularly black voters, um, being the ones who are committing fraud, right? Like it, and it which fits into the whole criminalization of black bodies in this country, right? It's like we are the continuous suspects. Um, for white America. And that suspect being suspect is really, so it's not just like crimes, but it's also around voting. And, um, and it's all fictitious. It's all faceless. It's all just white supremacy playing itself out. And one thing that I would really like to add to what you've said is that one of the immediate reactions I had to yesterday was this re-institutionalizing of the three-fifths principle that once was in the Constitution years and years ago, that Mm -hmm. these black voices don't count for as much or don't count at all um, in a voting sense. And yet I had heard, and you can correct me if I'm wrong here, Judith, that there were neighboring counties that were predominantly white that apparently had a few more regularities, excuse me, a few more irregularities in this election. I'm not sure Mm -hmm. if it was this one or the last one, but I had heard someone on CNN or another network say this, that there were neighboring predominantly white counties with more irregularities, yet there was no issue (laughs) about certifying them. There was no hesitation to certify them. So I don't know if you had known about this, yeah, I I don't know about it. I mean, I you know the irregularities are. I mean, I, like I don't buy into the whole irregularity because I think that there are always little things that are gonna happen, right? In an election, there are things that are human error. There are um, you know there's just things like that that. I, you know, I'm the first one to call out voter suppression now. Let me get, let's get that straight, right? Like, if there's, if there's like serious, like systemic irregularities, like, that's my job is to call that out. And even if it impacted white people, I'd call it out because what I want is a functioning democracy, um, so that all voices are heard. Um, and so I've not heard that, but, you know, the thing is that, even if I put that aside, the bottom line is that the that the Trump campaign continues to go after particular um, areas of our country uh, in terms of calling out this base, making these baseless claims around voter fraud. And those are places where black people are and where black people turned out, right? It's Atlanta, it is Milwaukee, it is Detroit, um, <laughs> it is Philadelphia, right? right. It's, and it's, so it's no, no coincidence that those are the places that they keep going after, right? And it is, it is all about being able to keep in front of um, their base, their like, their radical red meat racist, base 
the idea that black people stole something and this time it was an election and it's all you know it's all false they've got there's no you know as, as much red meat as they want there's no beef there whatsoever <laughs> uh because they keep going into court and they ain't got they don't got nothing i mean like you know i you know i just i'm just shocked that they can keep going into court with these basic claims because in 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 you know in my world you know if black lawyers show up with baseless claims um they're getting what we call rule 11 which is sanctions right from a court because you came to court with some bs and you know and you had no factual basis for bringing your claims and when you get rule 11 you can lose your bar license so you know these white folks these white lawyers are filing all this crap across the country and getting away with it right and because no one's gonna and and, and we know as lawyers that like when you look at rule 11 sanctions they are disproportionately brought against black lawyers and so these people including giuliani right <laughs> um go and file all these cases that have um that have no evidence yeah i mean you brought up something i was just going to add because as a as an attorney myself that is the thing that was screaming in my head. Rule 11, where are the sanctions? Come on, these people are bringing these frivolous lawsuits to the bar. That, that I'm sorry, you right. you would be slapped down real hard if you did it. Right. Especially if, like you said, as black attorneys, forget right. it. And, and, and right. no one's bringing up that conversation except, you know, and obviously in the black press, it's happening here in some parts of the black press. But generally speaking, you're not getting on MSNBC. You have all these legal analysts and I don't want to, I know you've been on a lot of these networks, but um, you have all these legal analysts and somehow none of them think to, t- to talk about that aspect of this too, which is awfully it's corrosive. It's funny because I, men- I mentioned, I was on Chris Hayes recently and Chris is a lawyer. So I mentioned it to him. I was like, this is, this is rule 11 all day. <laughs> I don't understand, you know. Um, but you know they don't they don't live in that world where they have to worry about um being punished right whereas right. black lawyers do right right um one other thing about this before I ask you more about the kind of work that you do and the advancement project um about this voting though this has been a sixty year plus attack on the black voter. By, I mean, the Dixiecrats, but also the Republicans. A 60 mm-hmm. year history here in this country of doing this. I mean, this certainly did not, and I'm not saying that you said this, you didn't, but this certainly did not, I mean, for, for, this is for the benefit of people listening or watching. This did not begin with Donald Trump. This attack on black voters has gone on for such a long time, and there's always been this institutional system pushback against the efforts that black people um, make. By you know sacrificing their bodies, doing all these things to get to the right to be enfranchised, and there's this institutional pushback, this systemic pushback. Whether it's something like Wayne County, whether it's the the the, the kinds of voting literacy tests that we saw back in the '60s about jelly beans, how many jelly beans there are in a jar, and I'm just thinking that this is not going to be the end of this. The, I yeah. think we're going to see more of this in the future where counties do this kind of nonsense or where they find some other mechanism after the fact mm-hmm. to hinder black people from exercising their franchise. Yeah, I mean, you know, <laughs> when the United <laughs> States was set up, right, as a as a as a foundational matter, voting was uh, was limited and restricted to white men who owned property. And so this is, you know, since the founding of this country, this has been, this has been the, you know, Achilles heel, I guess they call it. I shouldn't use these guys, but but it's been the problem. (laughs) And, um, and it is, um, you know, it is again about power and money um, and control and, uh, and like you said, you know, you, we start off with we start off with that. We start off with three fifths, right? And three fifths was a compromise that was around power, right? Around political power and making sure that the South had some semblance of of power for the number of 
enslaved people that were in those states to help them with the electoral college, et cetera. And, um, and then you move through, you know, we have, um, we have disenfranchisement laws around people with felony convictions because, you know, solely because that was the post reconstruction era way of making sure that newly freed black folks could not participate, right? By criminalizing them and saying, we criminalized you and now you can't vote. Um, then we have all of the Jim Crow laws that, you know, it's, it is the bubbles in the, in the bar of soap or the number of jelly beans or the literacy test, as you said, or the grandfather clauses, et cetera. And, you know, we get the, the Civil Rights Act of the Voting Rights Act of 1965. Um, but that didn't stop discrimination in voting, right? I mean, it just gave us like a, a tool as lawyers to use to try and fight it. Um, and so now we are in an era where um, we're still enforcing what is left of that law. Uh, and, you know, the playbook just changes a chapter, right? The playbook of voter suppression. So next chapter, right? The chapter after Obama was elected and there was white lash um, around his, his election was a chapter on voter ID. Um, and voter ID became the tool of choice to, that was really targeted at black and brown voters and young voters and our elders, right, who may not have had access to very restrictive voter ID. It wasn't just any old ID. It was like, did you have your name, your address, current address, your signature, and a photo on the ID? And so it wasn't as simple as, oh, everybody's got ID. No, not this ID. <laughs> um, and so then it was voter ID. Um, and, you know, and it's been purging and it's now, um, you know, what we're going to see after this election is going to be the attacks on vote by mail, because initially that was like Republicans were using that. And, you know, and they loved it. But then their boy Trump was like, he was like, oh, no, that's fraudulent. We can't use it. So then they didn't use it and we used it. And so now that we use it, they're, no, we're not going to, we got to put an end to that, right? And that's actually fraudulent now that um, that those other people have been using it. And so, you know, this is the push and pull that is about um, the changing demographics of America, uh, because the more that we see the browning of America, the more we're going to see attempts to restrict our ability to tap into our political power. And so, um, no, it is not gonna be over. Um, even if the John Lewis Voting Rights uh, Advancement Act gets passed by Congress, although it's sitting there because Mitch McConnell cares more about getting judges on the bench, Republican conservative judges who are unqualified on the bench, he cares more about that than voting rights um, and COVID, uh, even if we get that passed, we're still going to be fighting the fight. And that's because, you know, the people who have power want to keep power, right? right. And they're, they're, and you know, and it's not that they're scared, right? Like I hate when people say, oh, they're scared of what they're scared. <laughs> they just know that they, they want to benefit from the idea of power. And they, and it's like power to them is a, um, is a limited, a limited thing, right? And so you can't share it with a bunch of people. And if you share it with somebody, that means you lose something to them. And so they don't want to share it. And so that's what this is about. And, you know, the browning of America is like to them, like, you know, like the last stand of Custer or, you know, like, it's <laughs> like, we gotta, you know, we really have to make sure that we hold on to this. It's the last stand of white supremacy because they know if, if the majority is able to tap power, white supremacy comes down, just like all those monuments have been coming down. The handwriting's on the wall for them. And so when the handwriting's on the wall, you better look and be like, oh, we got to figure out a new plan. So a new chapter of voter suppression gets written. Yeah, this, this is this is like, you know, and, and the when when people like Lindsey Graham say, well, you know, 
we've got to review these vote by mail things because a Republican will never be elected again. He's talking about a white supremacy will will be over with. That's really what he's saying. And, you know, the, you know, the idea that he would go to <laughs> the secretary of state of Georgia, um, who himself, by the way, has unclean hands. That doesn't get talked about. You know, Brad right. Raffensperger, right. that's a whole nother right. story altogether. Right. He's got right. unclean hands with, with Stacey Abrams and the purging and all of that. Right. And there was a lawsuit this year or last year. And that He it, would be the last person to be cooking the books for a, a Democrat. <laughs> right. That, that is not happening in the state of Georgia. No, no, no. Yeah, I mean, it, it's ridiculous. It's, I, even the, the thought of them, like, but, you know, and then for Senator Gr Lindsey Graham to be pushing on him, allegedly pushing on him. It's just, I mean, that's just like old boy voter suppression stuff. Like, you know, we're just going to come for you. Yeah. I mean, it's, you know, this is, this is a ongoing fight that we, that we will have. And I think that what has happened is our turnout and our number um, have, you know, have shifted the conversation for them. And, you know, so it will be like, what's what's the next thing that they can do? And, you know, we're getting ready to go into redistricting cycle. And so that too, where redistricting is the tool by which we divide political power in this country by neighborhood, by geography. Um, and so that for them is they want to be in control of that process. So they can, again, not only you know, elect the people that they want, but also make sure that they maintain the power for, you know, when you draw redistricting lines, it's really 10 to 20 years worth of power you're talking about. Mm, wow. And then this gerrymandering as well, we've seen and stuff that happens in Wisconsin where, you know, Democrats are elected all the time, but yet <laughs> the Republicans still hold on to power based on the way they've drawn yeah. districts or gerrymandering that happens. And it's not just Wisconsin, these Republican state legislators in these states where there's right. large black populations too in these particular centers and metro areas. And it just, it the state level stuff is really critical and people need to keep right. their eye on that. We've got two big Senate races coming up in Georgia, January 5th. A reminder for listeners, uh, viewers, that uh, December 7th is the deadline in Georgia, if you're in Georgia, to register to vote for those critical two Senate races. Uh, very important. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. But I did want to ask you about the work at the Adv Advancement Project that you do, because, of course, there's mm -hmm. so many different dimensions to the organization. And again, the website is advancementproject.org. So many different things that your organization does. Can you talk a little bit about some of the things they, that it does? I mean, the education, there's all kinds uh, of things. Can you talk a bit about that, please? Sure. Um, so Advancement Project First is a national racial justice organization um, that works uh, to support grassroots organizations in building power to uh, end structural racism and white supremacy. And so at the heart of our work is building power. And so we support grassroots groups on a number of issues, voting rights being one, um, the restoration of voting rights for people with felony convictions. Uh, we have an education program that is pretty well known for our work around uh, ending the school to prison pipeline. Uh, and we now have a campaign for police free school. So we support um, mostly young people, youth organizers across the country. And when I say young people, I'm talking about like high school students, not like 30 year olds. <laughs> um, so, um, so we support them in advocacy and pushing on their school districts to do the right thing to take police out of schools. And the reason that we're doing that is because um, police don't belong in schools. Um, you can't build a nurturing environment with police who you don't trust. Uh, if we have learned anything in the past year since the killing of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor, Richard Brooks and others, it's that our community has a distrust of the police that is <laughs> rightfully um, a distrust, right? And so, we, um, so we've been working for a number of years with groups to, um, to get police out of schools, to use that money. So that for things like counselors and for all the other resources, restorative justice programs, so that young people can feel loved and nurtured in a school building, not criminalized, right? And it's 
And it's not just that, but also young people are getting assaulted by the police in schools, right? Because the same cops that we meet in the streets are the cops who are in our hallways. And so um, so we, we've been working with groups to also just reimagine what safety looks like in a school building. Um, and you can see that, you know, there are a lot of kids who go to school in white communities who don't have police in their school. No need them, right? And that's actually where the mass shootings happen. So, <laughs> so, there, so there's something to be, you know, to think about there. Um, so we work on that. We also um, work on immigrant justice issues and um, specifically on the criminalization of our undocumented neighbors. Um, and looking at things like the um, detention centers and the, the conditions of detention centers. Um, and then our uh, justice project is where our criminal justice and policing work is. So we currently, uh, for example, have been trying to get uh, some places to release people who are in jail due to COVID. So we've been challenging cash bail because people should not be held in jail um, this pre-trial held in jail because they can't afford bail, right? Mm -hmm. If you're wealthy, you pay it, you walk out. If you can't afford it, too bad, you're behind bars. And that is not what um, what we should be doing to people because there's real consequences for staying in jail, right? Yes. Like you could be evicted, you lose your job, you could lose your children. And so, um, so we have been fighting cash bail, but along the way, we've also... Um, been working on, um, because of COVID, the people are in jail, we're seeing that pandemic in the jails. And so you can't socially distance in a jail cell. And uh, and they're not known to be sanitary environments, nor do you get adequate healthcare in a, in a jail. So we've filed a number of cases. We have, a, uh, most of us are lawyers at Advanced Project, um, but we filed a number of cases, five lawsuits around um, COVID in jails. Um, and then we also are working on policing issues and supporting grassroots organizations that are looking to reimagine how safety is done in their communities, including those who are calling for defunding the police um, and building up like a support for, for protesters who are um, who are being beaten in the streets for protesting police violence, right? And so, um, so that's our work. And it really is about how do we support and give, not give, but support local communities in building power so that they can hold the systems accountable, hold their elected officials accountable, um, hold their school board, whether it's their school board or their prosecutor or their sheriff um, accountable for doing what those communities want. Oh, wow. I mean that 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 is just such great work that you that you do, and and I'm really glad that um, that you do it. And 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 I and I I know that there are other organizations out there, but yours is one of the premier organizations that's been involved in this in this particular way uh, for some time now. And I, I and I by the way, I hope the new incoming in administration talks to you. It, it talks to you and your organization if they haven't already. I, I would hope that they would because I think we'll you're... <laughs> say, say that again. I didn't hear you. I said, we'll see. We'll see. <laughs> I really... We'll see. Because we'll see. Cause it would be a great place to start. Um, any Anything else that you wanted to say regarding your organization or uh, about mm. what you think voters need to do? Obviously, to stay vigilant is one of them. But is there anything, and of course, and also any social media that you wanted to give out um, in sure. these last few moments? Sure. So, I mean, a few things. One is um, beyondadvancementproject.org, which is our main website. We also have a website called wecametolearn.com. And on We Came to Learn, that's, it's about the school police issues. And so we have a report there. We also, we produce a lot of things to help communities like start their own work. So we have like an action kit where you can like start to do work around police and schools. Um, on that website, we also have a map of where the um, school-based assaults have happened, um, police violence in schools. And so people should check that out. Also, we, you know, I think really what's important, right, is we're on the other side of an election. And what we need to know is that our power doesn't begin and end on election day and that we have to continue to engage with the people that we elected. 
sending them a little email every once in a while to like be like, oh, I agree with that or I don't agree with that is really important because they don't get a lot of, of mail. And especially because if you're living in a, in a place where um, everybody voted Democrat or everybody voted Republican, like people just get complacent with like, well, we voted them in. So they know what they're doing. No, they don't know what they're doing. <laughs> so, so we have to continue to push them. So like even with the Biden-Harris administration and like your question about, I hope they reach out to you. Well, maybe they will. But guess what? Even if they don't, they're going to know who we are. <laughs> For sure. I mean, they do know who we are, but, but like we're not going to sit back and be like, oh, they know what they're doing. And we're really excited to have them there. No, we've got to protest them too because they're not going to get everything right. And um, and so that's important is that people need to continue to engage because election day does not end our power. Judith Brown Dianis, the racial justice attorney and the executive director of the Advancement Project. I really do thank you for your time. Um, so valuable. I really appreciate you, respect you and your work. Thank you so much for being here on the Politocrat podcast today. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much. Very special thanks to Judith Brown Dianis, the racial justice attorney and the executive director of the Advancement Project. Really honored to have her on this edition of the Politocrat Podcast. I'll be back in just a moment. Welcome back. There are so many issues on the table um, to talk about, but I'm going to defer to tomorrow or maybe Friday, whichever, whichever. We'll see what happens with the news. Um, But there's a couple of things I do want to talk about in one of the next two days. Obviously, the Biden campaign and and, uh, looking back at that campaign um, and and obviously the success um, of that campaign. But I think even more pressing than that right now, the issues going on in the UK around racism and anti-Semitism, you know, anti-Semitism is a form of it, uh, anti-Jewish racism that's going on within the Labour Party. That's something that I want to focus on. Um, And the Tories as well, by the way. But the point is, is that this week there's been a number of things um, that have happened literally in, in the Labour Party, but particularly um, the matter of anti-Semitism, which is something that, um, as regular listeners know um, to this podcast, that I take a strong stand against. And not only that, um, if I see any of that kind of thing in my presence um, or hear anything like that in my presence, I will speak up. Um, and I'm sure many of you do the same thing. Um, I do want to talk about that. So, that's going to be, you know, that issue um, in the UK um, and beyond the UK, but particularly in these political parties in the United Kingdom, uh, certainly in the Conservative Party, but also in the Labour Party, what we've seen in Labour uh, and the other issues that go along with that, you know, in terms of in both parties, you know, this Islamophobia um that goes on in, in the Tory party, the conservatives, the, the racism that goes on, anti-black racism and the comments that uh, um, some of these members of parliament make and also um, the misogyny as well. I mean, those are a number of different topics, um, but I do want to focus particularly on anti-Semitism because this is, this is something um that is getting worse, not not decreasing, it's increasing. And what Sakir Starmer did today, I think was a good decision and the right thing to do, which was to refuse and decide not to restore the whip to Jeremy Corbyn. And I'll explain what that means for those of you who may not know what restoring the whip means. Um, that is parliamentary protection for one. And to have the um, power and duties of of a member of parliament in the House of Commons to be able to operate um, with the blessing and protection of the whip 
to carry out um, the kinds of duties and and parliamentary uh, things uh, in power as a member, meaning that you have the power to do that. Um, may have not given them the clearest explanation there, but the point is, is that I want to talk about this issue because this issue, um, again, is getting much worse. It is not getting better. And um, Sir Keir Starmer, who is the leader of the Labour Party, I think did a very notable thing today, which of course has um, angered some in the Labour Party, particularly some of those who support Jeremy Corbyn, um, and has delighted others, uh, particularly those who may not have been Corbyn supporters, um, but believe that action should have been taken here and were disappointed with what happened yesterday when Corbyn was reinstated to the party. But with Starmer deciding to not restore the whip, Jeremy Corbyn really doesn't have any parliamentary power whatsoever as an MP, Member of Parliament. But those are things I want to get into, especially the overarching issue, though, of anti-Semitism uh, in these political parties in the UK. Um, and and the focus on the Labour Party, because it's a party that I care deeply about. I'm a supporter of the party. And, um, you know, this is something that is a real problem that we've got to get rid of. We've got to end this anti-Semitism um, and any form of racism. Um, we cannot have this. So that is where I stand. And I will be talking about that um, in the next day or two. Uh, as well as the issues and other concerns of the day. So thank you very much for listening. And I hope you enjoyed the uh, conversation uh, that I had with Judith Brown Dianis. Um Again, much appreciated and uh, really appreciate her time. Thank you very much for listening to this edition of The Politocrat. I'm Omar Moore. Thank you.